touch. No. And um, this is synonymous um, with what we'll call equilibrium. equilibrium melting. And it's also a key component here is that it's closed system. Okay. And I should mention that this is also for crystallization. It's exactly the same thing because we're assuming 100% equilibrium. Let me explain uh, what I mean by that. So let's take a box. This is a system. This might be my magma uh, that comes in. And uh, it starts to crystallize. And so you have different uh, crystals in here. Those are the crystals. Uh, this is this part is the melt, and then the circles are the crystals. The whole thing crystals would smelt as the magma. We're going to assume that uh, chemically um, the crystals are always in equilibrium uh, with the melt from the core of the crystals all the way uh, to the rim. In reality, um, if the crystals are growing kind of at time scales faster than uh, elements can diffuse through the crystal, uh, then the core is actually not in communication uh, with the melt, in which case we need to consider a disequilibrium process or a fractional crystallization or a fractional melting process. Um, and we'll do that later. For now, let's consider it's always uh, in communication at all length scales. And so that's how we call it equilibrium melting or equilibrium crystallization. So whenever we, so what we want to do is track um, a certain trace element uh, through uh, extent of crystallization uh, or melting and uh, see how it gets enriched or depleted as you get more crystallization. So I guess I'm going to go with crystallization here. Um, and so in all of these problems, we just start off with conservation of mass, right? That's really all you need, conservation of mass. And what we're going to do, we're going to assume that the mass of this whole system is M0, okay? And that, of course, must equal the mass of all the solids plus the mass of the melt, right? And it's because it's a closed system. So that holds at all times. Then what I'm going to do is define these quantities. Uh, the mass fraction of the solids is equal to ms, right, over the total mass. Okay. And then the mass fraction of the melt is m m m total okay and if i divide everything here that first equation by m0 then what i'll have is one is equal to um xs plus xm okay and what i'm going to do to keep things simple is i'm going to call this thing f from now on this thing is the melt fraction. Okay. So now what we want to do is look at uh, conservation of mass for a particular element, a trace element. Okay. And we're going to define that the concentration, the mass concentration of an element in the crystal or in the melt is given by C, okay? Like it would be in parts per million, uh, weight percent, so forth. So the total mass of an element in my magmatic system would be uh, the concentration average of the total system multiplied by M0, right? 
and that then must equal the total mass in the solid, so CS, MS, in a given time, so CM, MM, right? Now, if I divide this entire equation by um, M0, then I will get this equation equals CS, one minus F, plus cm f and note here that i've used f in the place of xm so one minus f is xs right here um, so this is right here just the same as uh, the top equation over there now we're going to make um, use of another um, relationship which is uh, the partitioning right, of a trace element between two phases, the solids um, and the melts. So we denote that with this symbol D as the partition coefficient, and that is the concentration in the solid over the concentration in the melt. You always put the solid uh, over the melt, and it's to denote uh, how this element uh, might be distributed between the two phases um, at equilibrium. Okay, now what it's, it's empirical, and we'll talk about partition coefficients in another uh, lecture. But when D um, is it's not greater than one, we call this compatible in the middle. And when it is less than one, it's incompatible. Okay, some terminology for you. We can then take this and substitute it in here for CS actually. So CS would be CM uh, times D. And that will then give you this C0 is equal to um, D C M one minus F plus C M F. Okay, and we can rearrange all of this to get an equation that expresses how. Um, the composition of the melt evolves relative uh, to the bulk concentration of that element as a function of degree of crystallization or melting. That would be this D plus F one minus D right here. And this is the batch melting equation. Um, equilibrium crystallization or equilibrium uh, melting. And obviously uh, at equilibrium, CM is related to CS, the solid. So I could write the same uh, form for what the composition in the uh, solid would be. And that's the same, but you multiply it by that, by D. Okay. So now, and this is for the solid. Now, I should note that this partition coefficient really is what we call a bulk partition coefficient. If there are different um, mineral phases, like under the colors, some here that are dark and some light, this might be kind of pyroxene and olivine, say, in the mantle. Um, then the bulk partition coefficient is some sort of weighted average uh, of the partition coefficients of each of the uh, phases. And so D uh, up there is really the sum of the mass fractions of each mineral phase times the D for a given phase. In other words, it might be the fraction of, of phase A 
times D A, A plus F B D B and so forth. Okay. And F right here is with respect uh, with respect to the solid, not uh, the bulk system. So what does this uh, become, okay? So when you have a multi-solid um, phase system, you need to account for the different phases. And since it's, it's at equilibrium, you can just use this equation, just use the right bulk D, and you will actually have to correct for how F, these little Fs, the mineral or the phase proportions within the solids change as a function of F. If you do that, you're all good. Now, we can look at how this behaves. Um, I'm gonna make a plot here of this, this F right here. This would, over here would be 100% melt. And over here would be uh, no melt or zero percent melt, so it's fully crystallized, okay? And we can consider these scenarios and the y-axis is Cn over C0. Okay? If D equals one in this equation right here, right? then CM and C0 cannot change. And that should not be a surprise to you because if it's one, then nothing should change. So this line, one, I would call this one. Is D equals one. When D is less than one, um, the element is incompatible, and so with progressive crystallization, it should become more and more enriched in the melt. Um, and if D is greater than one, so this D is less than one would be here, and D greater than one obviously would be here. The melt would become depleted um, with progressive crystallization because the crystals keep taking away uh, that compatible um, element. Now we can look at when the case uh, F equals one um, in the same equation. When F equals one, then this quantity becomes one as well. That means when you melt it 100%, you should get to the bulk composition, right? So all these curves should uh, converge to one at F equals one. Now we can consider a case where D is zero, perfectly incompatible. Um, and when D equals zero, this equation, if I say D equals zero, and CM, C0 should equal one over F. So the maximum enrichment that you can ever get is when something is perfectly incompatible and is controlled by a degree uh, of, of uh, how much the melt you have. So when F equals one, no enrichment. But when F is like say 10% or 0.1, you have a tenfold um, enrichment. So this would be, the case for D equals zero. And you can't really get above that line, but you can see when F goes to very small, this goes up to infinity. Uh, so you can get extreme enrichments if you keep crystallizing, crystallizing, crystallizing to the point you have almost uh, a time, only an infinitesimal amount of residual uh, melt. Um, but for any given F, you cannot exceed the D equals zero line. Um, if it's compatible, then what you'll get in the melt is something that looks like this. Also will converge to one at F equals one. But the value over here is then equal to um, uh, one over D, okay? When F equals zero. And the same thing goes for up here. Right. Obviously, when D equals zero, this goes to infinity. 
but when d is finite, it's somewhere in between. Okay. Now the solids, if I were to plot the same solids on the same scale, now c solid, c zero, there, uh, what you'll get, and this being one, this is f, um, you will get a curve like that, or d greater than one, and then like this, or d less than one. So it's just the reverse. Okay. Where this can become useful for you is if you go and look at a magmatic system, often you might plot uh, like in an arc, like a arc system, volcanic arc. And let me plot SiO2, I plot K2O, and often you'll see an array that looks like this. It turns out potassium, up until you get to very high potassium content, is actually almost perfectly incompatible. Silica is not. But um, if potassium is perfectly compatible and you start off and say something here is your C0, and you're looking at it here like a rhyolite, C melt, then um, uh, you can then calculate um, the Cm over C0, approximately 1 over F, we can probably calculate then how much crystallization from a parental magma is needed to give you a rhyolite, if the rhyolite is formed by such a process. And so uh, you should check this out on your own, but if the enrichment factor from the parent to the rhyolite is about 10, right, then what that means is to get a rhyolite from a, over here, a basalt, this is a rhyolite, this basalt, uh, you're gonna need about 90% crystallization. So if you see one kilometers of rhyolite, which you really never do, but let's say you do, um, then you're going to need um, 10 times more uh, cumulates or everything else down hidden uh, at depth. 